I'm Tori and today I'm going to be talking about Ready Player One by Ernest Cline. I listened to the audiobook read by Will Wheaton and I enjoyed this book so if you want to hear my opinions go read it and come back and we can talk about it. So I've never really been a video game player. I think the last time I successfully played a video game I was about six and it was Winnie the Pooh themed. So I don't know hardly anything about the video games when they talk about that in this book but I was still very engaged with the world. The Oasis made a lot of sense to me. It seemed very plausible and it sounded like it would be a fun place to go even for people like myself who aren't as inclined toward video games. And I really liked all the 80s themed stuff. That was very fun. I loved trying to see what references I could pick up on and what references I couldn't. And that made me want to go and watch a whole bunch of movies and listen to a whole bunch of music and read stuff and just get really, you know, go and watch some of the media that they talked about in this book and then go back and read it again and see what else I got out of it. I think it's the kind of thing that the more you, like it'd be fun to go back in a few years and see if I got understood more of it and kind of have fun with that. And the geek culture in this whole world was just amazing. I loved it that from our main character's point of view that kind of geeks ruled the earth and you could have all these fun nerdy things that people were obsessed about and everyone knew about and people would have arguments over the princess bride and they could quote entire movies and that's how you move up in the world and all these really fun things. It was so cool to see that and some of these were things that I love and some of them were things I've never heard of but it was so much fun to see these people who were having so much fun just being geeks kind of enjoying that and I love that the whole mood of the book was very fun especially the opening when you're just kind of getting accustomed to the world and you see all this stuff that these people like to do I just love that the ending I love the Rivendell thing I liked how um, the whole book was set very 80s themed but Lord of the Rings wasn't 80s so to sneak that in there they said that it was Og's wife loved Rivendell, so they managed to make a whole replica of Rivendell in the real world and sneak that in, even though it's not technically 80s-ish, so I love that. It was very interesting how the book opened in the real world, and you start out with, okay, this is a kid who's, he's sitting in his trailer, in this stack of trailers, which was very, you know, I could picture that very clearly in my head. And you could see him, and he, I'm picturing, oh yeah, he spends a lot of time on his computer listening to stuff like he's doing at his aunt's house. And that's the first time we're in the real world, like solidly there, until the end of the book, or at least until the middle. And, you know, you're thinking, okay, this is the world, and you see what the world is like, and then you go into the oasis. And you don't want to come out either, because the world is not a fun place to be. And so that was it really made me empathize with the characters and understand why they would be willing to spend all their time in this virtual world having seen what their lives were like. I thought the hideout thing was really cool, his um, little burrow that he had inside the piles of old cars, that seemed like a great place to hang out. So this book was good, it started out great, I loved kind of the introduction to the world and getting to see everything and the build up to finding the first gate and that you knew from the beginning. In, I think in the opening chapter he said he was the first person to, whose name appeared on the scoreboard. You knew he was going to find the gate and so it was so interesting to watch that happen. You just couldn't wait for him to make that leap and find out about it. And then after all the excitement with the first gate was done, then the book just really dragged for me and he had to do his oh I'm gonna show off and act weird and he was getting to know Artemis in there but I couldn't even really enjoy that because he was just being kind of a jerk and not thinking clearly and basically everything he said after Artemis started finding the second gate you know he started berating himself and I was just kind of thinking, yeah, that's what I've been thinking this whole last section. Could you have thought of all those things sooner? And so it really drug for me between the first and second gates. I was not a fan of that section. And also I didn't find his security, like I was, I couldn't believe that the security measures he took actually worked because I was thinking there were all kinds of ways to trace him and he wasn't being all that smart with his fancy apartment and stuff. I just felt like he made a, 
Like he could have been more careful. I felt like he was buying all this expensive stuff and just being a little bit too flashy and attracting too much attention and not worrying enough about the fact that these people just blew up his entire neighborhood and maybe he should be a little bit more careful and that the whole reason he escaped was because he was poor and off the grid and hiding in a pile of wrecked cars. And so maybe going to the expensive Gunter hangout wasn't the best place to be. But nothing really bad came of it, so I guess it was okay. It was just a little uncomfortable. Once they got through the second gate, that was better. I liked that. I was more, like, the story picked up after that. And then the end was very kind of... They solved the quest and found the egg and all their problems were solved. The law finally took that moment to deal with the Sixers and stuff. And so I felt like there might have been a little bit more conflict to go through. And it was kind of amazing that suddenly Wade's avatar, Parzival, was just magically could do anything now. And I was curious to know what would happen, like, Og was also all-powerful. So what would happen if Parzival wished that Og had no powers or something? I would like to know a little bit more about what the restrictions were on that. I did really like, though, that we go through this whole battle and we have this fun quest. And he fixes this thing and gets to, you know, he does plays this video game and the video game life is going to be great now. But he's also figured out a way to enjoy the real world. And I thought that was very nice. That he, um, you know, he had that whole scene out in the garden with Artemis. And he said he had no desire to log back in anytime soon. And I thought that was really sweet. So I, one thing I didn't understand about this world was how privacy seemed to be absolute. And that is something that's very hard for me to understand. Because in the way I look at it, where there are computers and data that people want to keep private, there will be people who manage to get that data somehow. And I'm used to trying to think of nothing you put online as being private, no matter how hard you try to keep it that way. And in this world, everyone just accepted that things were completely private. And as we went on, we kind of learned that that wasn't the case and that um, the Sixers were able to track people down and do all these kind of illegal things to get to them. And so pr the illusion of privacy crumbled a little bit, but there were still some things that were absolute. Like I was amazed when Wade changed his identity and he took his fingerprints and moved them over to another identity. I was amazed that the Sixers and all their evil corporation didn't just have all that stuff on file. And they weren't just able to like start scanning through everyone in the world with their supercomputers until they found someone who had his fingerprints and that there was still that much privacy. And they were also, if people used their internet services, then they could watch them. But if they used their own private internet, there was no way to hack into that. So I was kind of surprised that there was as much privacy as there was and that people hadn't found a way around that. I was also confused about the hacking because Wade was able to go online and he talked like he didn't have a huge amount of money compared to lots of other people in the world who were also looking for the egg and all this stuff. And he was able to buy all these passwords for the IOI web things. And he was able to buy new identities and stuff. And so I was amazed that this was so easy for him. But people still treated this like it was just this given that it was all secure. Like he was able so easily on a train ride to change, or a bu he was so easy on a bus ride to just change his identity and switch his fingerprints over. It made me amazed that everyone just accepted, oh, we have your fingerprints. That's a perfectly fine form of identity, even though we know that that can be switched super easily. So I didn't get why they were so accepting of that when you can change your fingerprints and retina scans and all that stuff, why that was your form of identity when it was so easy to fake it. I also didn't get how Wade was the first person who was able to hack into IOI. It seems like he didn't talk like he had lots of hacking skills. He was comfortable with computers and he knew a lot about 80s trivia and stuff, but he hadn't actually spent that much time hacking. And he was just able to buy a few passwords and break into this whole secure system. And it seemed like there would have been lots of people who were very determined to do this. And even if they didn't purposely get taken in for credit card jail, then 
some of the people who didn't pay their bills would have had hacking skills and you'd think they would have taken advantage of it just by pure chance, even if they didn't plan it. So that didn't make a lot of sense to me. It didn't seem quite plausible that people would trust the security so much when it was obviously flawed. I didn't understand how artifacts worked. That was kind of something that was puzzling to me because they were very powerful, incredibly powerful. And I didn't know who made them or how they came to exist because obviously some of them were made by Halliday, the Quarter, and things like that. But there were other artifacts that had definitely been created after his death, like the one, like the one that Wade got when he was on the quest with Daito and Shoto that made him turn into Ultraman, I think it was. They specifically said that was made after James Halliday had died, so someone else did that. Someone else had the power to do that. And my question is, if other people had the power to do that, then why wasn't everyone making artifacts that made them all powerful? And what were the conditions to create these artifacts? Did you, did you have to buy a lot of like the digital land in the Oasis? How did you get the power to do this? Because it seems like the kind of thing that, you know, they talked about the Sixers buying up artifacts and there not being a lot anymore. But obviously Halliday wasn't the only one who created them, so who was creating them and why didn't the Sixers figure out a way to create their own and just make themselves invincible? And I was, I would have liked to know more about how that worked and where they came from. I also thought it was interesting. In the beginning, Wade had no money at all. He had his, he had his access to the Oasis because the school had given him his console and things like that. He had barely any experience points because he'd managed to rack all that up for free. He had almost no money. And then after the first gate, he got all these endorsement deals and he had way more money than he had before. And he still talked about how he was scrimping. And that was one of the things I really didn't like about that whole section of the book was that he was scrimping so much, but it was way more than he'd ever had. And he should have been basking in this amazing new stuff that he had, the, all these new toys. And he acted like he already didn't appreciate it. And that was weird to me. And then magically, somewhere after he'd made several pointed comments about how he didn't have too much money and he had to stretch it, he magically had enough money to buy all these passwords and crazy things. And like toward the end of the book, he was just spending money on everything. Um, really expensive time to plug into the Oasis after he broke out of credit card jail. And all this stuff and money just suddenly wasn't an issue anymore and I didn't understand where that came from. Now I think the biggest thing to talk about with this book is that it really presents the question of what's the difference between when you exist in the real world and people can see you and judge you on that and you can't hide anything versus online where you can be whoever you want and you can hide your identity completely and even if you really connect with someone you're still only showing the parts of you that you want them to see. And I thought that was a really interesting discussion to have. And um, Wade did connect very deeply with both H and Artemis, even though he'd never met them and didn't know anything about them. But he also, his perceptions of them also changed a lot when he met them, and that was very interesting. It was less so with Artemis. She was so worried about her birthmark, you know, she thought she was hideous, but she was actually quite... Everything besides that was quite conventionally attractive, and so that wasn't as much of an issue. We kind of glossed over that in the end. What was really interesting to me was H, because I didn't realize how many kind of ideas I built up in my head. When I first was introduced to the character of H, I thought, oh, this is a fun guy, you know? he's He was kind of... Um, snappy and he made fun of himself and his friends a lot and he was kind of macho in a self-deprecating way and it was really fun and I thought this is a fun guy he's loud he has opinions it's so much fun and then we learned that H was a plump black girl in reality in the real world outside the oasis and they kept a lot of the dialogue the same and she talked like the boy that I had gotten used to in the Oasis. And I found her abrasive because it was the same dialogue. It was the exact same personality, 
but because now I was picturing her as someone who's supposed to be female, it was different to me. I liked those traits before, and now they're just in a di different package, and I don't like them anymore. And that says a lot to me about myself and about our culture and how we need to try to be more open-minded and let people be who they are and not worry so much about the container and what kind of package their personality comes in. And so I thought that was really amazing that this book managed to get me to think that much when I was expecting just kind of a fun fantasy romp. And it really made me think a lot about myself and how I perceive people. I was really impressed that Ernest Cline was able to do that and make me see how many assumptions I make about people based on what their gender is and what I expect them to look like. So yeah, overall I liked this book. I liked a lot of things about it. it. The atmosphere was fun, I loved all the 80s stuff, and it really did make me think a lot about how I perceive people and how our culture perceives people and kind of puts them into boxes. And I really liked that. The pacing was a little slow, and that annoyed me at some points, but then once it picked back up again, I really enjoyed the story.